very large uh, color. Yeah, so we could ferment all these fibers. And you see that the shape of the body of humans change. Today, we have small color compared to there. We have color that is about 70% smaller. And it is very important to have colons if you rely heavily on plants because in nature, most plants contain a lot of fiber. Mm -hmm. So you better be able to get energy from that fiber. Otherwise you just wait, wait the energy collecting it and eating it and not being able to, to uh, exploit it. So you can see that the evolution of humans actually was away from plants. All right, so today I have with me Dr. Mickey Bendor. Uh, he's a PhD in archaeology. He's affiliated with the Department of Archaeology of Tel Aviv University, and he researches the connection between human evolution and nutrition. And the reason I wanted to have him on today is because he brings a very interesting and comprehensive perspective on how nutrition uh, has evolved throughout you know, the entirety of our history as humans and early humans. And it's somewhat controversial in today's political and social climate with veganism being, you know, a huge thing now. But uh, I really wanted to have him on today as part of the podcast series of what humans evolved to eat because he shed some very uh, interesting light on the question. So Dr. Bendor, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. So my first question, of course, is going to be what did humans evolve to eat? Well, they, they came, they started to become human. They, they ate lots of plants, of course, uh, coming from apes, fruits, and things like that. But what defines the humans, there's a paper by a researcher named uh, Boone, it says the uh, meat made us human. So the, the science, uh, archeological finds that separates the homo uh, genus from uh, previous Australopithecus uh, genus, is the fact that uh, we find bones and uh, hand tools uh, to deal with those bones, to, to deal with the meat, actually. So the, actually, the difference uh, that made us human uh, is meat, although people continue to eat uh, plants. Okay, so what you're saying, to paraphrase a little bit, is one of the pieces of evidence that we have that humans you know, what made us human is partially beginning to eat meat is that you find these kind of like cuts on the bone from hand tools that we used to use to actually get at the meat. Yeah, we find, first of all, we find the bone themselves together with the stone tools. Right. So <clears throat> you'd assume that they're not there by chance. And then you will find also some uh, cut, cut marks on the bones. Yes. Okay. So we first, you know, before we had our first early ancestors, we used to primarily have a lot of uh, plants and plant foods, fruits, uh, vegetables, things like that. But then that's when we started to see, when did we start to see meat eating? It's about two and a half million years ago, something like that, with the uh, homo habilis. Uh, and then we find more and more, and the stone tools are becoming, uh, let's say, more refined uh, with the... Uh, a species that's called Homo erectus that appeared about 1.9 million years ago. And this species, as far as uh, <clears throat> I'm concerned, and other people as well, was a real uh, carnivore, actually, you know, hunter that survived. And this, this is where the controversy begins, how substantially on meat. Yeah, I was reading through your paper about the, the evolution of the human trophic level, and it was pretty fascinating. Very uh, comprehensive paper there. It was a huge paper, a behemoth of a paper. Um, and I, I want you to kind of touch on a little bit, what are some of the pieces of evidence, um, not archaeological, but in terms of the anatomy? Like, how did we change? Okay, I must tell you, first of all, why I came to this anatomy. Most of the reconstruction of our evolutionary food position of uh, what we ate or how much is based on uh, present hunter-gatherers. Present, I mean, recent. But there is some uh, evidence that uh, scientists and, and travelers collected for uh, probably 100 years or so. So, so people looked at these summaries and they said, okay, these are hunter-gatherers. 
So that's what they must, must be what we ate during our revolution. They found that the uh, human, you know, were very, very, very flexible. Uh, where plants were more prevalent than animals, they ate more plants. And in the north, when the animals, where animals were more prevalent than plants, they ate more animals. So that was the idea. But the problem is the environment is just not the same as it was. And the main, difficult, the main difference in the environment is the availability of large animals. And large animals, the return, the energetic return of hunting large animals is about 10 times that of uh, hunting or, or collecting plants. So that rules out that flexibility business uh, because uh, uh, humans are limited in the amount of energy that they can consume, they can spend in a day. And uh, if, if you get the large animals giving you like say 60,000 60, calories per hour of work, you just can kind of go and say, okay, they disappeared. Now I'm going to collect a plants that provide me 1,500 cal calories. So it's what, 140 one of that uh, return because we just won't have enough energy to do it. So all this uh, flexibility business, I didn't believe in it. And I didn't believe in the, uh, and then I saw that the environment, I mean, there are papers that I cited in the, in my paper, it showed that the environment was completely different, especially in terms of large animals. So I said, where can we find uh, better evidence? And I came back, I came to the conclusion that the evidence is in our body. Uh, if we are, actually, if we evolve to become carnivores, some of uh, this uh, evolution must still be maintained in our body because the tra transition to agriculture happened, what, 10,000 years ago. And until then, we, we are still hunting together, most of us. So I assume that uh, we will find the signs in, uh, in our body, in our biology, in our uh, uh, morphology, uh, in our genetics, etc. And not all, not all the science, not all the, everything I could find, uh, but some, like 15 pieces of evidence from different parts of biology. The example that I use mostly is the acidity of the stomach. A researcher named Beasley, found out that the stomach acidity of a herbivore is very low, uh, of omnivores is like medium, carnivores is very high, <clears throat> and scavengers is even higher. And uh, lo and behold, we humans are with the scavengers. And acidity, uh, one of the rules is to keep uh, pathogens away. So that's, that's why, uh, you know, scavengers uh, have high acidity. But we humans are very, we are very special carnivore in that we take the prey to a central place and we dwell on it for uh, consume it over days, even weeks, and even months. We actually like a scavenger. So that's why we have this uh, kind of high acidity. If we didn't need the acidity, it wouldn't be there because it's very, very expensive to maintain. Right. So this is one example. But I had like 15. I can't say that I remember all of them. But hey. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that, was a, that was the example that stood out to me as well. Because, uh, you know, as someone who's very interested in nutrition, um, I wanted to really, uh, first of all, the dietary guidelines, as I'm sure you know, especially in the US is like, you know, the food pyramid, you have grains at the bottom, you're supposed to eat like everything grains, right? Um, and I just personally, me trying that, I didn't feel good when I was doing that. My parents didn't feel good when they were doing that. My friends didn't feel good. There's, you know, autoimmune issues, there's gut issues. And so I started looking into your work and I, I saw, oh, you know what, this makes a lot of sense that we, we have these sort of capabilities, these anatomical limitations as well, uh, like the gut acidity and you have like a smaller, you know, sort of intestine, we can't really 
uh, ferment as much fiber and get as much mm. energy out of that than like herbivores can. So everything that you're saying makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and there are a few other ones that you mentioned, um, but that's that's huge, I think, in, in the case for, for meat eating. Right, right. I think this is quite convincing because this is the biology. This is, a, this is us. So if we have like, a, for another example, we have many small uh, fat cells. And there are animals that have fewer, larger fat cells. So in order to keep the same amount of fat in the body, you can keep it in either way. So uh, the researcher who looked at it found out that we have many smaller uh, 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 fat cells. It has to do something with insulin uh, sensitivity, etc. We won't go into that. Mm -hmm. But uh, carnivores have the same structure, and omnivores have actually smaller uh, number of large cells. By the way, herbivores, and I'm talking about cows and things like that they have also very high number of smaller cells because as you know, they actually in the end feed on fat because of the, of the fermentation that they, they rely on. So they have the same structure of uh, fat cells as we do, but we don't have a structure that omnivores do. We have a structure that carnivores do. Another example is the, the weaning. So, so uh, we feed babies <coughs> for a shorter time than the chimpanzee, for instance. We wean at about two years old, and chimpanzees wean at about five years old. So, <coughs> and it so happened that carnivores wean earlier than the other other animals. So, you know, it, it, whenever wherever you take a group and you look at the group and how it behaves and then what you what you know what is the metabolism you found out that we are uh, closer to carnivore than to her to omnivores i mean there are many there's one thing i think uh, that should be made clear about 75 percent of the mammals are omnivore technically speaking in other words they eat plants and animals. Now, that doesn't mean, it doesn't say there are carnivores that are omnivore. And hypercarnivore, for instance, in zoology, the definition of a hypercarnivore is a carnivore that eats minimum 70% of their uh, energy as uh, meat from meat. So that leaves another 30% for him to, to consume plants. You know, uh, uh, wolves, for instance, in the season, they lived on, uh, they can uh, gorge on, uh, on berries. So yeah, we can consume plants. We did consume plants, no question about it. There are good archeological evidence that we did consume plants. The only question, is how much. And uh, what I found is that uh, we were actually hyper carnivores. Because if you look at the, at the animals in, in nature, if you look at carnivores, uh, wherever you find uh, carnivores or, or animals that uh, hunt large animals, like we do, they're all hyper carnivores. It's not something that you do for fun or you do as a hobby. You have to be adjusted, adapted, and you have to know. And then all animals as well, uh, for instance, lions, etc., they take time to reach their ability to hunt uh, large animals. They have to learn. And we also, hunters uh, reach their peak performance at about 40 at the age of 40. Mm -hmm. So it takes them many years to learn. It's not something that you do just like that. Okay, so we go get plants. Oh no, let's get animals. No, no. it just doesn't happen. You have to be, you have to invest a lot of time in it and you, and you have to do it full time.
Right. So we began as scavengers, right? And then you're saying that yeah. part of the reason that we had such a high stomach acidity, our stomach was incredibly acidic compared to uh, herbivores or, you know, omnivores who mostly specialized in plants was because we needed that acidity to uh, not get sick from the bacteria that we were eating. Right. Right. Yeah, we began as scavengers. That's, that's a good point. Hey, it was Australopithecus and even as, as a chimpanzee, yeah, we had a very large as, uh, color. Yeah, so we could ferment all these fibers. And you see that the shape of the body of humans change. Today, we have small color compared to there. We have color that is about 70% smaller. And it is very important to have colons if you rely heavily on plants, because in nature, most plants contain a lot of fiber. Mm -hmm. So you better be able to get energy from that fiber. Otherwise, you just wait, wait the energy collecting it and eating it and not being able to, to uh, exploit it. So you can see that the evolution of humans actually was away from plants by the fact that the small, the colon uh, shrunk by about 70%. And it was a much, you know, much more, I guess, cost-effective way to get our calories, right? You mentioned 10 times more than plants. Yeah, more than 10 times. 10 times today, yeah, you know, there are all kinds of calculations, but it's a different, uh, it's a different order of magnitude. It's just a different order of magnitude. Because right. animals have very have fat, have meat, <clears throat> and plants. The other problem with plants is that they demand a lot of processing before you eat them, and we don't just don't find uh, evidence for processing of plants until the very end of the Paleolithic. Uh, you know, uh, grinding stones that can grind. Cereals, yeah, they appear yeah, 30,000 years ago. 30,000 years ago, you're talking about the last 2% of the Paleolithic in terms of time. Mm -hmm. So, yes, at the end, you see this, you start to see that the humans uh, devoted attention and time to processing plants, but they, you don't see it before. Yeah, I want to get into some of the controversies surrounding that. There are some anthropologists. I've been looking through your uh, blog, your website, paleostyle.com, which I recommend people go and check out because there are some very interesting articles on there. Um, and I saw a few of the controversies like, oh, was the paleo diet actually vegetarian uh, or things like that, right? And so I went through and I read some of those papers. But before we get into that, I wanted to ask you to kind of clarify uh, a little bit more about the environmental changes that happened. I want you to kind of talk about the, the Ice Age. What, what was the importance of that? The Ice Age, I think the main importance of it was that more area became savanna than before. And you see in Africa, close to where people began uh, or humans began to appear, you see expansion in the area of savannas on the account of uh, forests. <clears throat> and we don't have a savanna near, <laughs> near uh, Michigan, <laughs> Michigan, I guess. No savannas here. <laughs> no. So I'm not sure that I can send you to look and see what the difference is in, in terms of uh, the quantity of animals. But there is a big difference. In savanna, uh, herbivores are easy, they, they find it easy to access food. There are all kinds of herbivores, but the one that eats leaves and now the one that eats grass. Uh, so herbivores that eat grass find, easy, find it easy to move in a savanna. And you find a lot of more biomass that uh, is, is uh, animals, belong to animals than to plants in savanna compared to a forest. So this is probably why humans, uh, homo, or why the hominids, let's say, which is a group of humans that started uh, uh, before, I mean, including those Stalopithecus, uh, why they became interested 
in animals because the, the environment changed and they found less and less fruits, for instance, and more and more accessible animals. So they started by scavenging, as we said, and then, then uh, yeah, this is the main, this is the main ecological dish change that caused the appearance of humans, in my opinion. <clears throat> but from then on, and we just published a paper about it, and we took what happened in the Levant. This is our area here in Israel and the neighboring countries. <clears throat> and you see that as soon as Homo appeared in the scene, I'm talking about Homo erectus, let's say 1.9 here, uh, the earliest site that we have in Israel is about 1.5 million years ago. Uh, in about a million years, you see much less larger animals. So the large animals became, began to disappear or get extinct. And even if they were around, there were not as many of them around, judging from the archeological sites. What we find in the archaeological cast, we find less and less large animals, very large animals. And it goes down and down and down and down. And by the end, you start with the, the largest animal 1.5 years, million years ago in Israel was a, an elephant that weighed about 10 tons. <clears throat> At the end of the period, when just before we switched to agriculture, the animal that used, they used to hunt was a gazelle of 20, 25 kilos. So it's a completely different story. And this has affected, in my opinion, the whole evolution and the whole uh, cultural uh, development of uh, humans. The, the flora changed from forest to, to savanna. During the ice age. Oh, yeah. The ice age, yeah, the ice age, uh, it was an effect of the ice age, but not, not there was no ice in Africa, okay? Ice was in, in the northern or southern parts. More. So even, even during the ice age, it was just, it was just during the northern and very southern parts? Yeah, yeah, but it affected, it affected the weather, it affected the climate. Got it, got it, okay. And climate became drier, etc. As soon as it became drier, uh, the forest disappeared and the savanna appeared. And the savanna was a place, like I said, that the animal could, uh, that's uh, that, that still today, in the savanna, if you go in the, in the Serengeti, for instance, uh, part of it is savanna. And you see many animals, but no trees. Uh, but if you go into a, a forest, you see many trees, but very few animals, in comparatively speaking, especially larger. Right. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. So there was more of the megafauna, more of the bigger animals right, as a result. Right. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. And then what caused the disappearance? I know one of your uh, one of your hypotheses that you mentioned uh, is that we actually had a role to play in the extinction of these animals. <sighs> Yes, you see, with this last paper that we did on the Levant, we checked what happened to the climate. So the climate is more or less the almost only effect that can explain uh, extinction of this magnitude for such a long time. So you're talking about, you know, two and a half, two, in our case, one and a half million years of uh, a continuous extinction or continuous decline in the size of the prey. So we looked at what happened to the climate, but it was not associated with the climate at all. There was no association whatsoever. So, so what can it be? I mean, the only explanation is uh, that humans did it. Now, it was large animal, very large animal. <clears throat> the problem, their problem, is that they take long time to grow. So if they, if you kill them, uh, they have a, a longer time to recover. Okay, 
It's not like cockroaches. They, they take years and years. The gestation of an elephant is uh, 22 months. And then it has to grow before it can produce, you know, another generation. So once you uh, overhand them, they're very, it's very difficult for them to recover. Now I'm not saying, you know, that they, it happened, it, it didn't happen in a year or two years or, or, or even a hundred thousand years. But what happened is that they actually were at the brink and then it just needed maybe some kind of climate change that they, and they came to the situation already uh, quite uh, weak in terms of uh, the strength of the population. The most people that uh, in my business agree that there was a megafauna extinction in the last 40,000 years or 50,000 years. 50,000, started about 50,000 years ago. Uh, in, uh, in the US it started later. Uh, but, and there's a big controversy there of whether humans did it uh, or, or it was some kind of climate uh, change that did it. <clears throat> and uh, but there are many, many that agree that the humans did. But uh, when we brought our paper, you're talking about a million and a half years, there was no way that climate, climate changes. Climate changes in cycles of 40,000 years, of 100,000 years. Uh, but, but it changes all the time. So why the trend continues and continues and continues? So I think the, this uh, controversy is no more, but, you know, we'll see. So it, it may not have been uh, as much the climate change. You said there was not really an association with that, but it might have been more that we overhunted. Yeah, the climate, the climate changed, but it changed in both ways. Right. So it, changed. it became drier and wetter, hotter and colder. Uh, so why do you see a trend that is only going in one direction? Yeah, um, I want to shift our focus to uh, one of your blog articles, which was titled The Complete and Unifying Explanation of Human Evolution. You write, the extinction of the large prey animals created a deficit in humans' energetic budget. There is a higher energy cost to obtaining 80 deer instead of one extinct elephant. So my question is, did that cost in energy lead us to start consuming more plant foods and less animal foods? Okay, what I'm saying, <clears throat> in the end, yes. In the end, towards the end, yes. And this is what you see in the last... Uh, 40, 20,000 years. And like I told you, you see more and more tools that are used to process uh, plants. <clears throat> That's in the end. What you see, <clears throat> this is my explanation. What you see uh, before is a adaptation to hunt smaller and smaller animals. And to, co to cope, with the energetic pressure that, uh, that is uh, caused by the decline in the availability of large animals. <clears throat> See, the human uh, prehistory is very strange in that it's unidirectional. Animals don't evolve in a direction. Animals, and this is a evolution, the theory of evolution, animals adapt to an environment. So if the environment, <clears throat> an environment change, an environment change in all directions. So there's no real reason for animal to evolve for two million years, two and a half million years in one direction. Everything became more and more intense, intensified. The exploitation of stone tools, uh, became more and more intensified. We needed to get better and better raw material to do this. The, the stone tools became more and more refined. Uh, our brain grew just one direction. Everything is going in one direction. And uh, the, I mean, the other, the exploitation of fire, there are many phenomena in prehistory that are all going in one direction. And this is, I mean, 
you can either think that we were destined, you know, from the beginning to become this smart uh, animal that will control the earth. Yeah, if you are so inclined. Uh, but yeah, I don't blame people that think that way because it's, it's like, it looks like we went and became better and better and better and better at exploiting the environment. What else? So if evolution is adaptation to an environment, then you need to find a driver, an environment that changed also in one direction for one and a half, or two million, two and a half million years. So that's, that's my, my hypothesis. This is why it's unifying because it explained all, most, not all, but most of the key phenomena in human evolution. And, and they are explained by the fact that we needed to adjust, to adapt, to a change in the environment. And the change was the decline in the availability of suitable prey for us. And suitable means large. The larger, the more suitable. Uh, so we had to develop, we had to become uh, smarter in order to not spend that much energy. So we had to know to, for instance, to uh, know the environment better, know our place better, know the other animals, the life of the other animals, uh, be able to transfer that knowledge to the next generation. So you need language. And all these things are very expensive energetically. So they could only, I don't see any other reason why we had language, if not to get more food. I mean, you have to pay for that expensive uh, ability that you acquired. And the only way to pay is to get food more, uh, more efficiently. So this is the, this is the, in general, this is my, uh, my unifying hypothesis. And it's very strange that uh, in, in uh, paleontopology, the area that I'm dealing with, until today, there isn't that. Nobody has ever uh, proposed that, that, that kind. For instance, if you take geology, today geologists have no problem explaining why you have uh, volcanoes, and the mountain ridges and the earthquakes, they can all be explained by the tectonic plates movement, right? So you have uh, all kinds of movements and the tectonic plates meet each other under and over and sideways. And this explains everything. So in, in geology, they had this, uh, you know, this uh, like unifying theory that explains a lot of phenomena uh, but the, it didn't exist in the paleontopology. And this one that I just outlined is the first time that it was done. Whether it's true or not, you know, it could take time to, to prove. Going off of that, I want to um, kind of get into some of the controversy. So I was reading through a paper titled Reconstructing Neanderthal Diet, The Case for Carbohydrates. And one of the argument that they pose is that evidence of eating plants, it doesn't really survive long periods of time, while evidence for eating meat like bones and stone tools does. So they argue that early humans ate many more plants and thus more carbs than we think. What are your thoughts on that? Well, that paper <laughs> is written by Karen Hardy, and she's uh, devoted her life to, to finding plants in the diet. And I think she did a very good job. And she found plants, and they were plants, no question about it. They were plants. <clears throat> and I think she did a very good job in that. The only problem, if you look at the paper, the, the, the question still remains how much. <laughs> she is trying to say that it was a lot, a lot. And basing herself, if you if you really care, read carefully on the current recommendations for, on the current uh, uh, nutrition recommendations. She says, the recommendations today are to eat a lot of plants. So that must be what we did in the past. This is the paper. 
Uh, this is, I don't want to, I know what you think about the recommendations and I know what I think about them. What can I tell you? This is it. This is, it. This is what can I, you know. Yes, we ate plants. Sure, we ate plants. Yes, you're, she's right. Plants don't, uh, they don't uh, leave traces, as many traces as animals do, because they're, uh, you know, the bones fossilize and plants don't. So yes, but that doesn't mean that, uh, that uh, you know, that we ate a lot of plants. Right. Yeah. And I, I reached out to her to see if she would uh, come on the podcast so I could get her, her, uh, uh, opinion on on the paper right. um right. but she hasn't answered yet so hopefully she will but uh, i i agree with you i think saying that because our recommendations now are to eat a lot of carbs that meant that that must be optimal for human health you know she says in another in another paper she says i think in this one too i'm not sure uh, that the brain needs a lot of sugar glucose right right so we had to eat a lot of uh, carbohydrate right i read that too <laughs> And this is ridiculous from a biological point of view. I mean, what about gluconeogenesis? Yes. So we, gluconeogenesis, we can do about 35% of our calories. We can do through gluconeogenesis. The brain needs 20% of the calories. Right. So there's still... Exactly. And she doesn't, and it, it, it's, it doesn't even mention the fact that we can use up to two thirds of our, our brain's energy. We can switch over to ketones, right? So we can right, use, right. yeah. Yeah. Right. So there's a lot missing in that, I think, but I, I would like to talk to her and see, get her side of the story as well. Another paper I wanted to talk to you about, it was called the evolution and changing ecology of the African hominid oral microbiome. And this argued that you have bacteria in the dental film of early humans, um, and that showed that starch and carbs were an important part of our diet. So can you kind of briefly explain what they found and whether or not you disagree or you agree? I, I wrote a comment, uh, which was published in, in this, uh, in uh, PNAS, <clears throat> the same paper, the, the same uh, journal. She found, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a whole team, I don't know, tens of people, they found a special uh, bacteria that feed on uh, on an enzyme that we have in our in our uh, saliva that is used. I mean, the enzyme is uh, used in its form in, in the in the stomach. It's used in another form, but but similar. It's used to uh, take starch and and and, and get the uh, glucose out of starch. So it's called ME1. Uh, the gene is called ME1, but the, the enzyme, I uh, forgot the name of it now. Amylase? Uh, amylase, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, so they said, okay, so if this bacteria was found in uh, humans that lived so many years ago, not not by the way, not so many years ago, but let's say 100,000, 90, 50,000 years ago. That means that we had it throughout our evolution. I couldn't find any justification for the fact that if they found it now, that it was there at the beginning. And even if it was there, there was no uh, quantitative association. So, do you get this bacteria when you consume 10% starch, 20% starch, 30%? Right. When do you start to get it? Uh, again, this is a, this, uh, they found something interesting, but they sort of take the, what they found and try to get much more, uh, much stronger conclusions than they actually did, in my opinion. So it can tell you that th that bacteria on the microfilm, it can tell you that maybe they had some sort of starch, but it can't tell you how much they had in their diet. No, they can't. They can't. Got it. And, and they found it with the Neanderthals that I think that most people agree were carnivores. Uh, 
I mean, they, they also had plants, but uh, most people agree that, uh, that uh, Neanderthals were uh, hyper carnivore. And they found it in there too, so. Yeah, yeah, that's, that seems to be, um, that's my current bias, which just letting everyone know that's kind of my bias through some of the anthropologists that I've, uh, the research that I've read. But um, yeah, I hope to get many more on the podcast and, and keep trying to answer that. Um, yeah. So before we finish up, I wanted to ask you what what things in the fields of uh, anthropology and archaeology what needs to be further investigated? What are the most important things that you need to be further in- investigated to answer what humans evolved to eat? Look, I see. I tell you what I want to investigate, but uh, I don't know what other things you need to investigate. I want to see, I want to investigate the the the. <sighs> I want to go further into the body in biology and find more and more. And look, I mean, maybe we'll find other things. Maybe we'll find that the uh, plants, you know, became uh, very important at one stage. Uh, there is a uh, one gene that appeared, I think uh, about 60,000 years ago in Africa. So already you get some idea that yes, maybe 60,000 years ago, there was a change. And this is a gene that allows us to obtain omega-3 or EPA, DHA from, from uh, vegetal omega-3 fats. So you say, okay, if, if the gene evolved 60,000 years ago, maybe we did eat more plants 60,000 years ago. So I think there's still a lot of potential in biology. Uh, it's called now uh, paleobiology. The other thing is the actually following the 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 same science, the same type of uh, study that we did on the Levant to do it in other areas in Europe, in uh, in uh, Africa, especially South Africa. Um, in China, or oh, actually Southeast Asia, to see if the same trends that happened in the Levant happened in other places in the world. Which is what I just started to dig a little bit and see, see I mean, dig the papers, not dig the, the, the land. But uh, I did find some signs that the same phenomena happened everywhere, wherever humans were, were present. Uh, and going back, you know, over a million years ago. So this is something that still is not well known in, in the field. And uh, it's not well known because it was not uh, well uh, researched. And people didn't really care for the size of the animals that much. Until, uh, and now I think with the, with the theory that I propose, it's very important to see if this same, pros- same uh, uh, process happened in other places in the world. Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a fascinating question. And uh, as you start to roll out more papers as well, I'd like to, I'd like to have you back on the show to talk about some of those, uh, those future papers that you well, have. Well, now I'm going to write a book. I'm not going... I, uh, I'm trying to find the partners for, for this research that I told you about, uh, to do the same thing that we did in the Levant in other areas of the world. I'm trying to find partners for that, but I'm writing a book because I have to put all the papers in one book. Right. Because, uh, the theory is wide and it needs to be, you know, concentrated in one place. Right. Yeah, well, let me know. Let me know when that comes out because I'd love to interview on on that. Sure, sure. Awesome. Well, uh, before we go, uh, can you tell people where they can find some of your work, maybe some links or social media? I think the the easiest place now is to go to Google Scholar. uh, And this is where you find the just right Bendor or Mickey Bendor. And I'm sure you'll get some some of my papers. There's a site called ResearchGate, which is like a Facebook for researchers that I'm uh, uh, cultivating. It's uh, I'm present there. 
So this, these are the two places. And then the blogs that you, you mentioned. Perfect. I'll have, uh, I'll have links to those uh, in the podcast show notes. Uh, so again, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate you yeah. having, having you on. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me.